Oh, so you wanted to learn the different theories that explain spatial variations in development around the world? <laughs> well, you've come to the right place. I got Rostow, I got Wallerstein, I got dependency theory, I got commodity dependence, and a whole lot of sass. So if you're ready to get them brain cows milked, Let's get to it. Okay, so there are four theoretical frameworks human geographers have developed to try to understand why countries in various levels of development are where they are on the globe. But before I start in on the four theories that you need to know, let me explain with a visual why this concept is important in the first place. So this country is more developed while this country is less developed. And the question isn't so much why are they at different levels of development, but why are those different levels of development explained by their geographical location? In other words, geography plays a huge role in how economically developed a country is, whether it's well wealthy or impoverished. Or to say it yet another way, it makes all the sense in the world, geographically speaking, that the United States is wealthy because of where it is on the map. And it makes all the sense in the world that the Democratic Republic of the Congo is economically poor because of where it is on the map. But what would blow a human geographer's mind would be if there was an extremely developed and wealthy country here in Central Africa, like, you know, Wakanda. In that case, all their dang theories would be about as useful as steel in a vibranium fight. And I should mention here that geographers often refer to this geographical distribution by the terms Global North and Global South, which are ways to categorize the relative distribution of wealth and power throughout the world. And get cozy with those terms because they show up a lot on the national exam. And in general, the General North includes wealthier, more developed countries, while the Global South includes the less developed countries of the world. And so keep that distinction in your back pocket because the uneven relationship between those two regions is what makes our global economy work the way it does. Okay, so now that you know why we're learning this theories, let's jump into the four that you need to know. But before I do, as is my custom, let me just mention that if you need help getting an A in your class and a five on your exam in May, you might want to check out my AP Human Geography Heimler Review Guide. It's got everything you need to study as fast as possible for that national exam. So, you know, if that's something you're into, check the link in the description. Okay, so the first theory that seeks to describe the spatial variation in development is known as Rostow's Stages of Economic Growth, developed by our boy Walter Rostow. And essentially, Rostow's solution to the mystery of variations in development was to claim that every country will ultimately pass through five distinct stages of development. And just for funsies, you should know that in terms of economic development, Rostow's stages roughly correspond to the stages in our old friend the demographic transition model. Anyway, Rostow argued that every country starts at stage one, which is characterized by agriculture, and then over time they will inevitably arrive at stage five, which is characterized by mass consumption and the overwhelming presence of the tertiary sector jobs. Therefore, what explains the spatial distribution of development across the globe is that countries are merely at different parts of the model. But don't worry, even the least developed and poorest countries will eventually become wealthy and highly developed in the long run. So that's nice and simple. But as you might have guessed, there have been significant criticisms of this theory. And the main criticism is that this model is too simple to explain actual reality. Like if Rostow were talking to all the folks living in the DRC, he'd look around at the shanty towns and the disamenity zones and the polluted water and he'd be like, well, dang, that's rough. But hey, don't worry guys, give it a couple hundred years and you'll be binging Netflix and ordering AirPods off of Amazon. To which they would say, okay, Walter, we'll be looking forward to that. Additionally, Rostow developed his theory based on development patterns in European and Anglo-American countries, which of course does not necessarily apply to countries with different cultures and history. It assumes that every country's economy develops in isolation isolation from every other country's economy, but in our globalized world, that is not entirely the case. It also assumes that countries will experience no obstacles from other countries on their upward climb through the stages, which again, not realistic. But then came along a second theory of development that sought to address the shortcomings of Rostow, and it's known as dependency theory. Now basically, it argues that peripheral countries are not poor by any fault of their own, but because of the persistence of exploitative economic practices carried out by core countries, and this is what we also call neocolonialism. In other words, for many peripheral countries with colonial past, their economic relationship with their imperial country left them severely disadvantaged in the era of their independence. Okay, says you, but the colonial era ended a long time ago. Surely those former colonies aren't still dealing with the effects of that stanky arrangement. Well, says dependency theory, they are, and that's because our world economy has developed a hierarchical and very specific division of labor. And we've talked about this before when we considered economic sectors. Countries in the periphery tend to focus their economic output in terms of extraction of natural resources and manufacturing goods. And that's their part of the division of labor. And then core countries tend to focus their economic activity and service work and mass consumption. And this is a delicate balance. Like if one part of the global economy doesn't play its part, then the whole thing goes wonky in a hurry. So according to dependency theory, the reason why differing levels of development exist is precisely because of the international division of labor. In order for core countries to remain at the top of the economic heap, peripheral countries are required to remain at the bottom. In other words, and this is the key point to remember, in order for core countries to be successful economically, they need to exploit peripheral countries 
countries and peripheral countries actually can't survive without submitting to that exploitation. And so in this way, dependency theory is better than Rostow because it recognizes the interconnectedness of the world's various economies. Okay, the third theory is known as Wallerstein's world systems theory, and it argues that the world has progressed through several stages of socioeconomic systems, and that today the world has arrived at the stage of an interconnected capitalistic economic system which plays out in nation-state economies. And I'm going to go ahead and guess you didn't understand much of that, so let me explain it up real nice. So the first thing to notice is that Wallerstein, like dependency theory, assumes a global interconnectedness between countries, which is the way the world actually works. Okay, so this theory explains the uneven distribution of development of the world based on core peripheral and semi-peripheral categories, which I talked about in a previous video. Anyway, Wallerstein argued that the reason core countries are the most developed is because they were the earliest adopters of industrialization. Like, they're the ones who started the race first. And as you know by now, core countries have access to the best technology, the most complex manufacturing processes, and societies characterized by mass consumption. And according to this theory, core countries aren't special, they just started industrializing earlier and thus have progressed further. So included in this category would be countries in Western Europe and North America and Japan and Australia. And then peripheral countries, like those in Sub-Saharan Africa, are the least developed because they are late adopters of industrialization. But if you're paying attention, you probably just grew a question mark over your head. Doesn't that sound exactly like Rostow's theory? Like every country is just progressing through stages of development and some are further along because they started earlier? Excellent observation, my dear pupil, but here's where Wallerstein takes his explanation further. You see, according to world systems theory, peripheral countries are the least developed because they are late adopters of industrialization, but there is a very significant reason for that. And unless you've just been asleep for this entire course, you're probably going to know what that reason is. Imperialism? Yep. The answer is always imperialism. You see, many peripheral countries have a colonial past, and because that political and economic arrangement created inequality between the colonizers and the colonized, those inequalities persisted even after those countries gained their independence. And of course, that would include countries in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, some parts of South America, and Asia. Now, semi-peripheral countries are places that also often have a colonial past, but have since adopted industrialization and play an important intermediary role between core and periphery countries. And the best example here are the countries included in the BRICS organization, namely Brazil, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. So to sum up, according to this theory, the answer to the puzzle of the spatial arrangement of global development is that every country's economy is connected to every other country's economy. And because in this current stage we have seen the development of an international division of labor in which core countries work in the tertiary and above sectors, semi-peripheral and primary, secondary, and tertiary, and then peripheral in the primary sector, this explains why some countries are more or less developed than others. And finally, the fourth theory you need to know is called commodity dependence theory. And according to this theory, there's a strong strong link between economic underdevelopment and countries whose economies are dominated by commodity exports. Okay, now recall that commodities describe agricultural products or raw materials that are bought and sold on the global market. So what this theory is saying is that the percentage of a country's economy devoted to commodity exports can often predict the level of development in that country. And there are two reasons for that. First, in the short term, commodity prices across the world fluctuate regularly. For example, oil prices are high today and then tomorrow they're low and then up and down and up and down. So if commodity prices are high and a country's economy is dominant, by commodity exports, then that economy will grow. But if in the next week the prices drop, those same economies will suffer. And then second, in the long term, commodity prices steadily decrease over time. And that means that an economy specializing in commodity exports, which is often referred to as countries with micro economies, will also shrink over time right along with it. Well, okay, click here to keep reviewing other topics in Unit 7, and click here to grab my AP Human Geography Heimler Review Guide, which is the fastest way to study for that national exam in May. I appreciate you coming by, and I'll catch you on the flip-flop. Heimler out.